Alright. <laughs> Welcome <start>. everybody. <laughs> this is uh um, my <laughs> Oh my goodness. My name is Ann Alton. Um physical therapist here at Illinois Regional Pain Institute. Um I my disclaimer is that I am not a pharmacist, but I brought one today. Sweet. All right. <laughs> this is David, and he's gonna be helping me to teach this part of the class um, because we have so many questions about the medications that we take for pain and not very, very good answers. I tried to simple it up um, and, and think of it in terms that I can understand, um, but at the same time, there, I, I truly hope that the information that I came up with is enough um, because it's so complicated <laughs> that I felt like I'm only, I'm scratching the surface or I'm not being quite accurate or something like that. So please just understand that I was only really trying to just simple it up so you kind of have an understanding of how these medications work in your system um, and why they have some of the side effects that they do. We may not get through all of them in one class. So we may end up going into Jan uh, January to finish off That's some fine. of these. Um, so any questions, um, he's, he's said that he's willing to field questions. I will probably do a lot of the talking, but um, if you hear me say something stupid, please interrupt it. <laughs> Anybody else that knows <laughs> anything, you know, that has has some understanding and that disagrees with what I've said, please speak up, okay? Because uh, this is kind of learning for me as well. Uh, so the first one <laughs> that I have listed uh, to talk about really is acetaminophen, and that's just Tylenol. Um, you find that in a lot of other medications. Um, you'll find it in Excedrin migraine. You'll find it in with um, some of the opiates for like Norco and Vicodin and the oxycodone and stuff like that. So you'll find it as a component in a lot of other medications as well. Um, this one basically, um, it just increases the threshold required for the nerves in your body to fire. Okay, we talked about, I mean, a lot of you were here last time, so we went through a little bit about how the brain and, and everything works. Um, you have a certain kind of all or none principle. When you have, <coughs> sorry, I have a family a little sore throat today, so I'm like, sound like <laughs> nervous. I may later. Um, but anyway, the um, you kind of have an all or nothing. Either the nerve is going to fire or it or it's, does, doesn't have enough information to fire, okay? Um, so what this does is it increases, you know, the amount of stimulus needed in order for those to fire. Okay, quick word, I have the word nociceptor in there. Nociceptor, um, it's, it's under the, the dash mark there, okay. It increases the amount of thre the threshold for nociceptors to fire. Nociceptor is just the fancy term for nerve endings in our body that pick up possible danger um, signals, okay? Some people will call them pain receptors, okay? I make the differentiation because pain doesn't actually happen until it gets to the brain, okay? And we've talked a little bit about this before, but if you can think of, I was trying to think the other day, how am I gonna describe this? If you can think of um, going home and getting a kiss on your cheek from your sweetie, what does that feel like? Pretty pleasant, okay? If you're out standing on a corner waiting to cross the street and you get a kiss on the cheek from a homeless guy. Oh, not so much. You, okay, so same, same input, but a whole different environment. And so now all of a sudden what was pleasant, same input, is now all of a sudden takes on a whole new meaning because of the other circumstances. Your brain is doing this all the time in regards to pain and any other sensation that you have. It's always looking at what's going on around it, what's happening, so is this dangerous, is this not dangerous? Good okay. thing, bad thing. Yeah, yeah, so it has to not only take into account the amount, the, the information that's coming in, but also the circumstances surrounding it. Does that kind of yeah. help make that a little clearer? Okay, so that's what acetaminophen does. The big thing about acetaminophen is that it is processed through the liver not the kidney. So you have to watch other medications that are also processed through the liver. That's including alcohol. 
So that's why it says on the back of the bottle that if you drink a lot, you shouldn't take acetaminophen or Tylenol. It's because the, the liver is busy detoxing from the alcohol and it doesn't necessarily have enough to do the acetaminophen at all. So some well. do kidneys, I mean kidneys do some and some liver does some? Mm -hmm. I figured they both did, okay. I don't know, do they both do so, a little bit? It's mostly detoxified in the liver. Yeah. Right. And it kind of excreted through the kidneys. Right, okay, so okay. Kind of, okay. Yeah, but some of them are, are really filtered through kidneys. Right. Like the yeah. NSAIDs that we're going to talk about yeah. next. Those are primarily filtered out through the kidneys. They do so a lot of, okay. That's why a lot of times a pharmacist may tell you, and again, check with your pharmacist, your doctor, before you actually do this, but a lot of them will say, well, you, if the Tylenol doesn't do it alone and the NSAID or the ibuprofen doesn't do it, you can take them together because the Tylenol is filtered through the liver and the NSAID, the ibuprofen is filtered through the kidney. So you're not overstressing one of your filtering organs. But again, double check with the pharmacist or your doctor before you, before you do that, right? All right, so the NSAIDs, you okay? Do you, do you have anything else to say about that? The only thing I'd probably add is, uh, Recently, they changed it. You used to be able to take up to four grams or four thousand milligrams of Tylenol in a day. Okay. And they started running into a lot of uh, um, maybe at least liver damage, if not liver failure. So okay. um, it was earlier this year, I believe, they cut it back to three grams. Okay. And another Good reason on that is. Yeah. Um, Let's say you're taking maximum dose or three grams or close to it right now, uh, and you get a cold. So you go buy a cold product. It's like Ann said, they got some maybe yeah, the equivalent of 325 right. or 500 milligrams of Tylenol in that. So now you're over the max. And right. You know, right. didn't even really aware. Of, Wasn't aware, aware of that. And let me tell you, the, the, the liver issues with, um, with Tylenol, and the personal story on that <clears throat> is that when I was in high school, I had a lot of headaches and a lot of other issues, and you would never believe it, but I was a little bit nuts. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I, but I, but I would take a lot of Tylenol, and I would, you know, I had headaches every single day, and I figured, well, two Tylenol, let's take three. Yeah. Well, three Tylenol, let's take four. And so pretty soon I was taking handfuls of this stuff, and I was getting really bad, like, rebound headaches. I would feel, like, just very, um, like, I'd been exposed to a lot of toxins. It just felt, like, poisoned. And it ended up being that I was taking way too much Tylenol. To this day, I can't really tolerate very much Tylenol because it's pretty cumulative, the damages, and, it's, um, and it sticks around for quite a while. So I have to really be careful of what I take, you know, people offer me except for migraine or whatever, and I'm like, eh, can't really do that because of that long term. So really, it's, they're very serious when they say you have a limit on how much you can take so per day. Of, it just sticks in there kind of, even after years. I don't know if the if the molecules themselves stay through so or if the, if the liver is, it is does it, the damage just sticks around. Okay, okay. All right. So it doesn't bind it, the damage just, okay. Yeah. Does so it does repair itself at all over time? Um, yeah, I mean, time. yeah, it, I, I have a time. firm belief that the body is always repairing, but I just don't think that it just, I think my body also at that point understands what this molecule is and said, don't do that anymore. It's kind of like, you know, kind I of have a feeling of that. Muscle. I have a feeling that that yeah. happens. Yeah. I think your body kind of develops, a, it's almost like you're bouncing a ball. It's like, don't do, I think yeah. the molecules almost. No, well, my 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 um, <laughs> my story on that is the is the Southern Comfort that you got really really drunk on in in high school and you know, puked it up and then now even now you can't stand the smell of it like you somebody brings it to you you're like oh no can't do it <laughs> can't do it my stomach says no way right <laughs> you know so it's I, I kind of think of it as it, some of it is probably a little bit of a protective mechanism for I don't here. know what's in my head or what actually is going on but it just seems that and I don't know how to put it, it just seems that your body automatically is like hey yeah no don't. Just, yeah not a good idea and, and it know makes you regret I know but you stuck a, in the office whatever for everything is it? <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> what are you gonna do about that <laughs> right okay so the next one the NSAIDs um, <clears throat> this is NSAID stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory 
drug, right? Drug. Okay, and basically this is just a group of medications that help to decrease inflammation in your body. Um, they're good for temperature and inflammation. Uh, we typically use this for mild to moderate pain. Uh, we can use it for rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis too. Um, and again, we talked a little bit about their, it's eliminated through the kidneys, so um, you can watch other drugs that are also eliminated through the kidneys so you're not overtaxing. Um, and if you have renal failure or know somebody with renal failure, they probably cannot take NSAIDs for that reason. Um, one of the things that I learned that was very interesting, the last uh, continuing ed course that I went to was that NSAIDs actually really don't work for nerve inflammation. So if you have a lot of nerve pain, and it's especially in the morning when you're stiff and the cardiac output is down and so you've swollen up overnight, um, that works great for like the arthritis swelling, but it does not work so well for the nerve swelling. Okay? And that has to do with the, the um, blood-brain barrier. Okay? Um, so the best thing that works for that is movement. Yeah. Yay! Because <laughs> we all know we want to move and <laughs> we first wake up in the morning. But um, that you, know, part of what I, the reason why I'm telling you some of these things is because you will find your doctors will ask you, what do you take for it? Does it work? Okay. So actually knowing, yes, I've tried to Advil for it. No, it doesn't work. That can really indicate what might be going on. Okay. Or I took Advil, and yeah, it helped some, but not all the way. Okay, so maybe we have some, you know, soft tissue swelling, and we also have some nerve swelling going on. Okay, so a lot of times your practitioners will ask you, what have you tried before, and why does it work, or does it work or not? And if so, that can give us a clue as to kind of what's happening in your body and what's what's going on, what the pain mechanisms are. Does that make some sense? Okay. Yeah. Um, this one, so, okay, so there's another big word for you, prostaglandin. I had to look it up again. Uh, this is a chemical that promotes inflammation and fever that goes along with swelling. And what the NSAIDs do is they block those prostaglandins from being, from being made. Sort of like your antihistamine will block the histamines from being made so that you don't get the runny nose and all of that. Same kind of thing happens with this, okay? Um, This also helps to regulate clotting and blood flow. So you may have, if you have a procedure happening, they may ask you, are you taking any blood thinners? Are you taking right. any of those things? Right. And that's one of the reasons why is because it helps to regulate the clotting within your body. So if you take a lot of the Advil or ibuprofen or Aleve or naproxen or whatever, that can really change the way your blood clots. Okay. Um, can also cause some GI bleeding. Pretty much everybody probably is at least familiar with that side effect. Okay. Um, now, do you do you happen to know why it causes stomach bleeding? Just irritation to the tissues, I think. Okay. Plus, it's it's going to thin out the blood. Right. And, and if you're taking like one aspirin a day for heart uh -huh. or preventive maintenance, and you start taking NSAIDs along with that. Uh -huh it's going to have an additive effect on thinning the blood. Okay. So, you know, they're going to bleed a little more easy, you get a bruise, and, you know, that's kind of the reason. And at that point, maybe you should kind of back off the NSAIDs a little bit. Okay. You mentioned aspirin for the heart. Is the generic aspirin just as good as any others? Yes and no. <laughs> you can go to the dollar store, you can go to... Macy's. Um, <laughs> right. Macy's sells Pretty much. Uh, I get your money. Pretty aspirin. much, it's gonna. Yeah, once it breaks down and gets in the system, you know, aspirin's aspirin. Um, the only thing you can run into with generics is they may not dissolve as fast, or it may not dissolve as complete. Okay. So you know, it's only. Match them up anymore. Ew. It does not taste you good. You learned to like it. <laughs> <laughs> you get over it. Actually, yeah. I do like it. Yeah, do you? I do like it. Aspirin didn't taste good. Oh, she does. Yeah. Okay, you're just weird. I know that from like, being a child. I don't know why. I haven't done it forever, but. Are you sure about that? Because, I don't know. Pretty sure. 
<laughs> she don't I don't remember. know. I can't. I can't. <laughs> Like, I can't remember who I got here, so I, <laughs> I do know I like aspirin. <laughs> I like okay. Okay. I also like Alka-Seltzer, is that oh, one? <laughs> yes. Right, let's move on. Okay, so, all right, so the next, the next group um, that we're going to talk about is the muscle relaxants. Um, they come in two groups, the benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, and um, the, the benzodiazepines you may be familiar with because um, also given for anti-anxiety. Um, so Xanax, Clonopin, uh, Transine, Valium, Ativan, Xerax, a lot of those. Uh, basically, that does a couple of things. It decreases fight or flight, um, so it can decrease the anxiety that's associated with the pain. Can decrease the muscle tension and just overall kind of help you cope. However, the caveat to this one is that a lot of times, I just want people to be careful using it, okay? Number one, they can be addictive. It can be very addictive. But number two, um, if you're constantly reaching for a pill to help you cope with your pain, then you sometimes may get the idea that you can't cope with it on your own, okay? And you really do have the tools it just takes a little more work, okay? And so I, I want to I wanna make sure that people understand that, that yes, that can be a godsend in some ways, um, but if you're always reaching for that pill to help, um, you may start to lose the sense that you yourself have the power to do it on your own. I don't know. You don't have that problem. Don't have yeah, you don't take any medication, really. <laughs> All right, so, um, so those are... Those are one option. Um, the other ones are the non-benzodiazepines, and like this is like the baclofen or the flexoril that you may get in the ER after a car wreck, um, Xanaflex, Norflex, Galaxin. Anybody here is familiar with some of these words? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, All right. So these decrease muscle tension by working um, at the junction between where the the nerve that comes from your brain on the all the way out to the muscle that's supposed to be firing and stopping that information from getting to the muscle. Okay, a lot of them do. There's, there's two ways that it can act, but this is the main, main way. So you have a signal from your brain, which is the output in response to all the input of, of you know, the nociceptors and what environment you're in and all of that stuff. And the brain says, we need to split that joint. <laughs> we need to make sure that it doesn't move. And so you stiffen up, okay. Um, that's your output, that's your response to the pain, whether it's cognitive or not. Most of the time we find our, we wake up at night and we're like, yeah, okay. So most of the time it's not conscious behavior, but it's your response. And so what it does is it works right at that muscle junction and keeps that, that nerve from telling that muscle to fire and to contract. Does it work at all of the muscle junctions or is it... Okay, that's so it doesn't just downside. target one, it works at everything, okay? That's the downside, okay? And it also can depress the uh, depress the, um, the centers in your brain that are responsible for heartbeat and, and breathing. <laughs> so, so obviously, you know, don't take it with anything else that might do the same thing like alcohol or no, what else does that? Lots of other medications. Lots of other Lots of stuff. Most of these cause a fair amount of drowsiness. Like even Flexoril will cause about 40% drowsiness. So if you get 100 people, 40 of them are going to be drowsy to the point they probably can't drive or shouldn't drive. And, you know, operating machinery, stuff like that. Uh, so all of them kind of, even the benzodiazepines, uh, still cause a significant amount of drowsiness. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. be real careful with them on that. <clears throat> and you were talking that these don't just target the area that's sore, that it does not so mm -hmm. every area. But like the shots and stuff. The, the shots, the shots and, and the topical ointments and everything like that, the thing to remember about is, is all of it acts completely systemically, okay? If you have a shot that goes directly at the point, so the, pay, the more concentration goes there, but it's still going to get into your bloodstream and it's still going to affect all the rest of your body. Okay. Um, the thing with taking pills is it also has to go through 
the, the gut. We're talking about that. It has to go through the liver. It has to go through a bunch of other things in order to get into the bloodstream to get where it's going to go. And some of them, um, you have to take a whole lot more because most of it gets eliminated in that first pass through the liver or the kidney before it hits your bloodstream. And so there's not a whole lot that's available by the time that all happens. Some of the medications, they, make, they sail right through those filters. <laughs> so you don't need to take very much of them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, the other thing, the, the reason why decreasing muscle tension can help with pain is even if you have nerve pain, if the muscles are really tense around the nerve pain, or around the nerve that's paining you, that can put pressure on the nerve that's already this close to firing. Okay, so if we can release that, give it more blood flow, it's less likely to be on a hair pincher. So you, um, you know, releasing some of that. Basically, we're talking about treating the container that the nerve is in. Right. Okay, if we can get the container to be more roomy and have more blood flow and all of that stuff, then the nerve gets more blood flow as well. Okay, that's why massage can help because that just treats that container that that nerve is in. Um, massage helps more than anything. If we all had our, if we each had our own massage yeah. person, I think nice. a lot of <laughs> massage could be really awesome. All right. Yeah. Um, and you know what's funny is that for a long time, they, the big they, you know, the they, um, and we're saying that, you know, well, massage just feels good. It really doesn't do anything. Uh, you know, ask, ask people that really do have a lot of back pain if it helps or not. You know? Right. Hugely. Okay. Helps. Part of it is because you are treating the container mm -hmm. that the nerves are in. Secondly, the, the muscles themselves have nociceptors in them, and if they're tight and they're not getting blood. the blood flow right. there, they can start to squiet. Anybody that's been sitting on one butt cheek for a while knows that you have to switch because the blood flow starts to... to Do you need a butt massage? <laughs> <laughs> oh, honey, let's Is that your way of asking for a butt massage? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay, so... Moving on. <laughs> Let me switch <laughs> while you're talking about that. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> All right. So the whole thing, the other thing that it can do is it can actually desensitize some of these sensitive, really extremely sensitive nerves. So it can help to kind of calm those down a little bit. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So the, the other type <coughs> of non-benzodiazepine, and I, I, I don't know if this is correct exactly or not, but you find, if you look up muscle relaxers, you're going to find a, a category called spasmolytics. Those act centrally. So they make it less likely for the nerves in the, in the spinal cord and the brain to fire. Okay. Um, that just sounds dangerous to me. <laughs> it does sound dangerous. Um, but basically, it's, it's just getting to the signal before it gets to the muscle itself, okay? It just, it just stops oh, it up okay, here. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. That's what they wanted to do to me. They, they called it a spinal cord stimulator. Mm-hmm. They wanted to implant it. Mm-hmm. But it has a lot of downfalls. Yeah, there's there's yes. there's a few downfalls to it. Um, there are some people that get great relief from it, and right. there are some people that just really don't. Yeah. Um, you know, or it's not near as much as the trials. Um, and that's actually not a medication at all. Right. But what that does is it just stimulates those nerves <clears throat> so that there's it acts on what we call the gate theory of pain. And basically the theory goes that you only have so much information that can go through the spinal cord at one time. Okay, I think of it in terms of um like a toll gate. Okay, so you have these toll gates, and you only have so many cars that can go through those tolls at the same time. Okay, well, if you allocate half of them for just trucks, okay, then the trucks get through a whole lot quicker. The trucks being the good feeling, oh, that the, the electrical stimulation, that feels really good. If you, if you allocate half of them to the trucks, then not so many of the cars, and i.e. The, the, the danger signals can get through to the brain. Okay, so that's how that, that's how that kind of works. Um, I, 
that kind of like a tension? It is kind of like a tension. No, it's implanted. Though. It's implanted. I don't, I don't like that tension at all. Yeah, you know, most people. I mean, there, there's there's a lot of people that really really like it, and there are other people that just don't really feel like it does much of anything for them. I mean, it's kind of a temporary stopgap. What is it? The tens unit. Shock ship. Oh, I've yeah, got it's a little of those. unit that you stick a little yeah. electrodes on you. Have you ever had that before? I've just had like kind of. Yeah, I had yeah one <laughs> sort of like that. Yeah, and it really did. The yeah. fact that a guy gave it to me to take home. It really like yeah. yeah on your spine and it, it kind of was like it just like it was almost vibrating. vibrating. Yeah. Some people say it's yeah. vibrating, some yeah. people say it's different settings you can do deep pulses. Mm -hmm. Yeah if you got an issue with um, really really tight muscles and not wanting to move those muscles that might not be comfortable for you. I don't like it on my neck. You know, I get a knot in my back or something it helps me. Yeah. Get it, it'll beat it down. Do you have one at home? I ain't telling you you might fall me. <laughs> I hear some things medicine. knocking over and lots of. Uh, I don't care. How you, you where, they, they, they where got some generic them? ones out there you can find, but I, I think you're look, look, yeah, look, look at Craigslist. Sometimes you can find them for like you know twenty to fifty bucks. So. All right, because I, I would spend some money because they do help. The other thing is, and I yeah. never knew what it was because I was like twenty five years ago. So. Yeah, yeah, they're better now. Um, but you can get them from your doctor um, if you have Medicare. They will not pay for it for low back pain anymore. Okay. You have to have, um, but you have. A, do you have to have a prescription to get them? Well, if you, you want your insurance to pay for it, oh, then, okay, yeah, then you have to have to go through your doctor. Otherwise, you could probably buy one. And they're just they're called four hundred. Tens units. Tens. Tens units. Tens units. You know, like T E N S. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Tens units. All righty. Um. <clears throat> all right. So anti-epileptics. Oh, there's, there's some big words out here today. Yeah. All right, so Neurontin, you may have heard of Gabapentin uh, or Neurontin, um, Lyrica, uh, Lamictal, uh, Topamax, Trileptal, some of the ones that you may have heard of. Um, it's somewhat effective in treating nerve pain. Um, basically, my understanding of that is that it just uh, basically decreases that nerve firing, correct? The nerves in your in your brain and spinal cord everywhere just kind of decreases the likelihood that they're going to fire. Okay. Um, you do need to monitor dosages um, primarily because they're liver. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Okay. So you monitor, need to monitor dosages and probably liver function, um, and you just can't stop it. You have to taper off on these. Um, and usually they'll taper up too if they're going to start it. Maybe okay. only over three or four days, but rather than give you standard dose okay. right now, uh, which will cause a lot of drowsiness again. Because the nerves in your brain aren't firing right. as fast. It slows the CNS in your brain. It just slows it down. That's why a lot of people take it for epilepsy. Sometimes they'll act like they, it takes them a little while to think and slower reaction, stuff like that. Actually, on that, they need to adjust the dose, but uh, it can do that if, if it builds up in your system or, um, you know, if you're just taking too high a dose mm -hmm. for, you know, your body to handle it. So, what's the that side effects going off of it? That would be extremely dizzy. They have to yeah. Seizure, off of it. Dizzy, yeah. drowsy, oh, well. sleepy. Uh, well, that's probably the big one, right? Yeah. Getting a seizure coming off of it if you go mm -hmm. off too quick. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what else happens if you go off too quick? That's probably the big thing. Okay. Um, okay. The benzodiazepines will also, you can also have a seizure coming off of that if you just stop it abruptly. Right. Have you heard of anything like that looks like tardive dyskinesia with, uh, with that group? With the benzodiazepines? No, oh. the anti epileptics. Um, Particularly like Larica? Um, those, again, we're getting into a to stronger agents, so uh, they're going to have a little more severe side effects or adverse reactions, so yeah, you do have to be careful. Hmm. Have you heard of any type of tardive dyskinesia associated with that yet, or? Mm -hmm. None yet? Okay. 
However, it wouldn't surprise me if the main thing with like tardive dyskinesia and um, Parkinson's are sort of related because we're looking at you, the dopamine in the in the brain, and that's kind of your 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 brake and your and your accelerator pedals not working function. You know they're not functioning so much, and if you're decreasing the likelihood of some things to fire in the brain, uh, that may I, I would I would reason that out to be that that would be a possible side effect. And this was more of a firing. Firing. Hello. <laughs> oh, wow. And you don't have a cup of coffee in your hands. Alien hands. Fire. Alien hands. <laughs> Woohoo. Hey. Alien hands. All right. I have that just in case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let it be documented now. Okay. All right. So the next one antidepressants. Um, and we've talked in here a lot of a lot about antidepressants, um, using them for chronic pain treatment. Um, and the, my my theory, my basic theory on why they seem to help, is that the body doesn't know the difference between your emotional stress and your physical stress. And so, if you're needing extra chemicals to help you deal with whatever stress it is, um, that can that can help. Okay. Um, the, the typical ones that are used for pain control are the tricyclics, like the Elevil. Anybody heard of Elevil? Okay. Um, Tofrenol, uh, and Afrenil. Um, some of those, <coughs> they act a little bit differently, and I don't know if you can describe the mechanism of action on how those actually work. Um, uh, well, they actually also increase serotonin. Yeah, so that's the, that's the the end right. rate is they they increase the amount of serotonin in your system. Um, the uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So I don't know if you've heard of SSRIs like the Paxil, the Prozac, Zoloft, all of those. Okay, um, what that does is we have a a recycling center. So like you remember if you remember last week we talked about. We have this little gap between our nerves, and the information gets from one nerve to the next nerve through that gap by using neurotransmitters. Okay, serotonin is one of those neurotransmitters, and if if it comes from this side to this this side, and it doesn't get picked up, then it's kind of hanging out in the in the in the gap there. Well, if it hangs out for too long, this old the 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 initial nerve ending will kind of suck it back up and kind of repackage it and try to use it again. Okay, um, so the idea between the, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors is that it's going to um, not do that as much. It's not going to do this much recycling, so more of it's going to hang out in the gap, okay, and be ready for use to send the signal on. So in a sense, it makes those nerves fire a little better, okay. Um, the other thing that the serotonin will do is in like the spinal cord, it will make it less likely for nerves to fire carrying danger signals up the line. Okay. 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 So that makes yeah, mm -hmm. some sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. So it makes it less likely that those danger signals are going to come up. And your body will actually make that for you. Um, if you're in a situation where you really don't need to know about your, your twisted ankle, you need to get out of the burning building, it's going to help to, you know, it's going to manufacture more serotonin, it's going to send it down, it's going to say, I don't know. There are other chemicals that it uses, the opi natural opioids, the endorphins, all of that stuff. Can, but those all serve to kind of dampen that signal until they, later. <laughs> until you, yeah. Until you get out of the burning building. Okay. <coughs> All right, um, so the, I guess the SSRIs are not used for pain typically. Um, they don't seem to be as effective, although um, personal experience, I think I've told some of you guys this before. I was on, I was on Paxil for a really long time for depression. I felt like, oh, I'm not depressed anymore. I can get off of it. Tried to get off of it and didn't realize how much it was helping me to deal with the pain. So yeah. it was doing something. Um, so the pain went up and, you know, so that's what happened. I think to everybody that happens, they're like, oh, I don't need it. I must be fine. And then you're not. 
you realize you're not after three weeks later, you're like, and you're yeah, back kind of in the same boat. Right. I've done that several times. I think probably everybody does that at some point or other. <laughs> Okay, so we saved, the, we saved the, the best for last. We saved the opioids and the new stuff that's coming out, which I'm going to let him talk more about because I just have not heard. Um, oh, I miss steroids. Um, but then, then we're going to talk a little bit about, if we have time, we're going to talk a little bit about marijuana because uh, it's being big, the whole mar big medical now. marijuana thing going on. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Got a good guest speaker. Yeah. <laughs> Are you the, uh, it's big now. I have a cousin. That's what I'm trying. That's a sure guy. That's my cousin. <laughs> yeah, we know. His name's Andy. <laughs> <laughs> he just made that up. No. All right, so, so I'm going to skip ahead to opioids and I'm going to just cover steroids really quickly. Steroids do decrease inflammation. Um, they're part of the body, like cortisol. We, we talked a little bit about cortisol in here and about how that um, can help with the healing process, but it helps to, to regulate your inflammation in your body when it's, when it's being produced by your body. It helps to regulate it. It doesn't let it get too far out of control. Okay, so what we do with steroids a lot of times is it's just an attempt to kind of jumpstart that for your body. Okay. Um, when we do shots um, with that, it's just kind of targeting the inflammation that's around certain nerves. The same principle go for like the epidural injections that yes. we get? Yes, yes. Yeah, so you're, you're, like what side effects do those actually have? Because they don't, they don't tell you. Good question. Uh, one of the things that people seem to complain the most about is they just kind of feel jittery and kind of not in their body for a little while afterwards. They kind of just feel a little off. Uh -huh. um, I attribute some of that to the effects that it has on your blood sugar. Okay. okay. Anything your else? Blood sugar. Yeah. Quite a bit. Well, yes, it does. does. Well, if you think about cortisol, <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> if you think about how cortisol is our body's way of getting the sugar from our stores and into our blood, and all of a sudden you add in a whole bunch of cortisol-like things, so what is it going to do? Is it's it's going to get the sugar from your stores and put it in your blood. So that's going to raise up your, your blood sugar. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it break down soft tissues everywhere? What about, would it, would it increase like muscle spasm or not, uh, like a Charlie horse? Is after this recent time when I had a series of shots, I started getting these like Charlie horses in the ball of my foot and terrible, you know. That's horrible. And yeah. It's the so and I didn't I didn't have it before I got the injections. Okay. And are they how, how long ago were the injections? Oh, I've had three for three over about five months, maybe maybe okay. six. Did it start the first time? Yes. Okay. Hmm. Did it subside at all in between? Um, yeah, maybe a little. Okay. I noticed it more right after I get it. Are you dehydrated? I've heard like kind of dehydration does, but I it, drink a lot. You a lot of water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's one of the easy things that we, we can do sitting on the couch. Right. <laughs> you right. know, <laughs> so we can at least make our bodies have enough water. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not sure on that. Was it targeting that, that particular side? Yes, it was actually. And. Do you know, like the epidural was in was in like the low, like L four, L five area. I mean, he hit the nerve. When he hit the nerve, I felt it all the way down to my toe. That's what I'm wondering. Is <laughs> if maybe we've ticked off that nerve just a little bit because oh, we've, it, yeah, we've it was stuck not it, and now it's just firing <laughs> and saying, "Hey, you remember me?" <laughs> yeah, no, I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. Hey, remember that one time? You're like the little ladies. They keep grudging. <laughs> Remember that one time? All right. <laughs> and as soon as you think it, it has forgotten all about it, hey, remember? Okay, so let me ask you this about those in particular. Uh, I've had them before, and they never help. Okay. And then just recently I've had them, and they seem to give me, you know, quite a bit of relief. Okay. Um, is it a shot? Yeah. Oh, it hurts. Yeah. Like has the, is somebody getting closer than the 
than they were maybe? Were they shooting better? Well, that's what I feel like because nobody ever did it the way this guy has done it. And I mean, he, he hits the nerve. And, and yeah. the other times that I've had it, uh, I was kind of out of it. You know, they gave me extra medicine to kind of make me, you know, not yeah. know what's happening. And this guy, they don't do anything like that. They just give you a little local and hold on. Bam. Oh, yeah. I didn't get a local. I had them in my neck, and I, I'm telling you what, it felt like an ice pick going through my neck. I was waiting for it to poke out the other side. And then when they inject that stuff, and it feels like liquid fire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and it never helped. I mean, it, no, I didn't want no more. Well, that's the way I felt for years. And, you know, I, I got to the point where I was, I didn't have any more resources. Options. I ran out of options. Right. So I said, okay, well, we'll try it. And I actually did get relief after about maybe six times of not getting relief. I've had eight of them, and I ain't having any more. They're done. <laughs> <laughs> They're done. <laughs> I tried it um, twice. <laughs> yeah, it can, it can vary from practitioner to practitioner. It can also vary a little bit on maybe, maybe your issue initially, the first few times that you had it, maybe that wasn't nerve inflammation that you had. Maybe it was more, you know, joint inflammation. Maybe it was more Huh? tissue inflammation or something along the lines that it wouldn't affect as much. Huh. Or it uh, didn't get in the, the correct yeah. area. Well, yeah, that's exactly. what I feel like that's it didn't get in there because Maybe he missed that nerve. This guy made sure yeah. that he hit that nerve. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't the a pleasant experience, but I, I did get a lot of relief from it. So, you know, I hate going and getting it done. <laughs> yeah. It's about 90 yeah. seconds of cell. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I, I have been getting relief from it, so. Yeah, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. So yeah, one of the other things that, it, that, that cortisol can do is that it can, <clears throat> if used too often, it can lead to breakdown of tissues. Okay. Um, so, you know, trust your doctor. When your doctor said, I can't do any of these, more of these for six more months, that's what he's worried about. Um, can also um, inhibit bone formation as well. So people with osteoporosis or bone bone forming issues may have some difficulty with that as well. Like the degenerative bone disease. Yeah. 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 And the steroids will do that. Yeah. It can. Just short term, uh, yeah. kind of while that is still higher level in your system, but yes, it's possible to. You know, especially if you're taking something to increase that bone growth, yeah. uh, it could kind of either oh. turn it way down or turn it off for a few days. No, yeah. because I do have osteoporosis yeah. and osteoporosis. Yeah, me too. So, and your doctor, process. yeah, and like, your doctor is aware of that, and and so some of those risks have already, you know, he's yeah. weighed those risks. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's something to consider as far as you know. There are a lot of doctors out there who. You know, in addition to, you know, an antibiotic, if you have a, a sinus infection, they also want to, you know, throw steroids at you. You know, just make sure that you're, you're aware that, that that can impact your, your ability to, you know, a lot. It can impact a lot. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's just kind of one of those things to ask. Cal I take calcium plus the D3 in that. Mm -hmm. or will that interfere with that? I don't really think there's not seen much. I think you're okay with that. Yeah. Those are nat pretty naturally occurring yeah. substances okay. in the body, so I think mm -hmm. you're probably okay with that. Yeah. All right, so now we're going to turn to the opioids. All right. Um, these guys, we have these receptors called opiate receptors in our body um, that help to transmit the possible danger signal to your brain. They also are in the gut, and part of the reason why they're in the gut is because they help to transmit the information that um, a part of your intestine is stretching. Okay, so there's food in it. <laughs> Send that information on up to the brain, so the brain can say, okay, we need to, to do some what we call peristalsis, which is to squeeze here, then squeeze here, then squeeze here, then squeeze here to kind of help move things through. Okay. So when we block those, we tend to block them all. 
So that's why a lot of people get constipation when they have, when they take Norco or Vicodin or Oxycodone or some of the other ones, okay? Uh, Demerol, he's done a nice job, Tramadol. Um, Tramadol is one of those confusing medications. <coughs> people often get put on Tramadol to avoid an opiate. Right, that's right. what I didn't understand right here. Yeah. Um, it, from what we have been able to tell through scientific studies, it is less of a um, addiction danger mm -hmm. than some of the other ones. The tramadol. Uh -huh. The tramadol. Okay. I didn't even know it was an opiate. Most oh, yeah. of them, most doctors will sell it to you as it's not, and it's not addictive. Okay, but it is technically considered an opiate, mm -hmm. and it also increases serotonin. Mm -hmm. In okay. your in your body, so it acts in a couple of different ways. I didn't feel like it helped me all the time. Sometimes it would, sometimes it wouldn't. So I, I don't take it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't blame you. <laughs> Why take something when you're not sure it's yeah. gonna work? So. Right. Um, so so basically, all we're doing is we're blocking the likelihood of information carrying possible danger signals to get to the brain. Okay. So the less of that information that comes through, the less pain, theoretically. Okay, problems with this is these are kind of important receptors. And if the body decides and notices that a whole bunch of them aren't in use, we need to make more. Because this is important information. <laughs> and so you have to increase your dose to fill those receptors. So you have to increase your dose to, refill the, to fill those receptors. And then the body says, wait, what happened to all those receptors? We need to build more. No. And so this is why you have that constantly up, okay, tolerance we call that building. the tolerance wow. building. And that's why we call um, this very addictive. Because then when you come down off of it, now you've got a ton of these receptors. And you're hypersensitive I, to pain. Exactly, you're hypersensitive. That's it's the word. Yeah, yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah. everything. Yeah. Everything, not just the back Girl skin. Pinky yeah. all of a sudden hurts. Yes, yes, you're you're absolutely <laughs> right. Um, the other problem, besides that that addiction potential and that that um, tolerance building, is that it can actually increase nerve inflammation. So oh, remember wow. how we were talking about how sometimes. We have pain in our nerves because they're they're swelled up and they're not getting the blood flow that they need, and that's why. And the NSAIDs don't help to clear that. The opiates can increase that. Wow. Um, so, so really, the the opiates are, are really only good for really really short term use. Mm. So you broke a bone, or you had a surgery. You're using it for two weeks. You stop. Okay. Oh. Um, so, so that those are some of the potential problems with it. Now, understand that I get it when you are in 10 out of 10 pain and you're sitting there and you've been treated by every ER in town because I think you're drug seeking and you're sitting in front of your doctor and you're you're crying and you're you're desperate and you say please, please, please do something. I don't care what. I don't care if I get addicted. I don't care what happens. I just want this pain to go away. You gotta have that relief. You gotta have that relief. Mm -hmm. Understand that that's, doctors are only human. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're gonna look at you and they're gonna understand that you're, that you're suffering and they're gonna wanna do what they can. And right now this is one of the big tools that they have. It's a bad tool, it's, I don't wanna say it's a bad tool, but it's not the best tool, but it's one that they have. Short term. It should be short term, but doc, nothing has changed. I'm still, I'm still hurting. You know, the docs are going to be like, okay, well, we can try an injection, or we can try this, or we can try that. But in the meantime, you still have to live your life. You still have to go to the grocery store. You still pay have bills. to make, pay bills and do, you know, make food and clean your house. And you still have to do all these things. And you're thinking about that, and the doc's thinking about that. Okay, so that's part of the problem why I think opiates have gotten to be such a big problem in the country is because it is a tool that they can use and temporarily it does seem to help. And so, okay, here you go. You know, I'm going to try. I'm going to do my best to help you. Okay, so I think that's part of The other thing is is that, that it's, I don't know about recently, but 
throughout history, it's been pretty easy to get those prescriptions filled by the insurance companies. You know, mm -hmm. some of the newer stuff, some of the other stuff, they're going to be like, eh, I don't know, do you really need the, you know, the autoimmune disease right. drug for this? Or do you really need, what, have you tried Vicodin? It's like, so it takes a while for all these different parts of the healthcare system to kind of catch up. Mm. All right. And we're all desperate in the meantime. All right. And all these pills can get you a DUI. And yes, the pills can get you a DUI. DUI. You might not be feeling funny or high or whatever, but if you get an accident, you got to test. You, yeah. They test. You can certainly. And how many people out there that are deaf loopy? Oh, I know a guy who lost his job because he got in a minor fender bender. It wasn't even his fault, but it was company that policy matter. that you get tested. And they got tested and huh. wow. yep. he yeah. lost his job. Well, your, your fault if you test and you're positive. Right, right, right. You shouldn't have been on the road. Yeah. So therefore, exactly. that accident would never have happened. So weren't you saying a second ago something about new uh, medicines coming out? Yes, I'm going to pass this over to David now. He, um, <laughs> knows a little bit more about some of the, the emerging He tried to slide things. under the radar. <laughs> <laughs> no such luck. No such luck. Uh, yeah, this, uh, there's always some new stuff coming out. Sure. Uh, I won't go into everything's here. You can kind of take a look at it. Uh, but a lot of them are these uh, no, new stuff is uh, monoclonal antibodies. And, you know, I, there's a lot of research going on. Uh, but it, I see kind of be careful of those two because, you know, they're new. Uh, we don't really, you know, a lot of times you see a new drug come out and six months to a year afterwards, they're recalling it. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Too many adverse or serious side effects. So, and, you know, the, I think of some of the ones I see on TV. You know, it's like, oh, to do this, it's good yeah. for, you know, <laughs> psoriatic arthritis, it's good for, you know, other things. When you get a wonder drug that's going to solve a lot of problems, be ready because you know, you're going to yeah, yeah, you're gonna eventually start seeing some reactions and, and negative stuff come back. Mm -hmm. so, you know, because they always, on those, a lot of the TV commercials, where they'll say, um, well, they have disclaimers now. It's like, yeah. oh, death, this yeah. and that yeah. and this. Some of them <laughs> only say, um, may increase your likelihood of uh, developing tuberculosis. It's like, hmm, what's that term? That's a long, we thought that was gone. Right, uh, yeah. And, you know, so uh, on those, it pays to read the fine print. And, you know, so. He said you're supposed to say What is that specifically for, those? Uh, like again, a lot of pain. these are going after the inflammation. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so anti-inflammatories. Well, they go at it from a different angle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and when you have inflammation, you have um, a just a huge number of chemicals that your body releases. One of them is the prostaglandin that I said earlier on. One of them is histamine, which you may have heard of um, because of you know your allergies and whatnot. Um, this one is TNF alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha. It's another one. It's a and so all of these are grouped together under a word called it's cytokines. Okay, they are the messengers of your in, in immune system. So NSAIDs are going to work against prostaglandins. Antihistamines are going to work against like Benadryl are going to work against the the histamines. Um, well, there's some other ones. There's another one. There's another an allergy one that, that actually targets a different, like... You mean like a uh, uh, tagamat that hits an allergy as well as the yeah. blocking the acid? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. so there's, there, but there's, there's, a, there's a couple of them that, that say, oh, this one works differently than Benadryl because it attacks a different, and I, I don't know where you think. It attacks the mast cell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of different ones. And so a lot of these will attack one particular of these cytokines, mm -hmm. okay? Um, the thing about this one, um, the TN TNF-alpha, is that it's, it's tumor necrosis factor. 
Um, and we kind of need that. If you think about what it says, tumor, necrosis means death. Yeah. Okay, so we kind of want some of that around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, it, but basically, I think what they, you, they, they're created a lot for the autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the ones where these things are completely out of control, so it's trying to take down those inflammatory factors. What about sense. those in, in relation to warfare? It, what was that? What about them in relation to warfare? Um, I'm really not sure on that. I can't have any, you know, inflammatories. Yeah. Um, this, it this just thins the blood well. more, yeah. and the warfarin is there to thin the blood. Right. Yeah, we just don't want you to to bleed it, bleed out if you bite right. your tongue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 All right. So, uh, also very expensive, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some of these newer ones. Yeah. Then, what about the biophosphonates? Again, looking at targeting the cytokines, so the messengers for the inflammation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's being used to treat bone loss and osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. What does it do for that? Just keep breaking down, keep from breaking down the bone? The it, it actually stimulates new growth. Does it? Okay. Mm -hmm. So ketamine, I thought that was interesting that you put Isn't ketamine in there. It's, it's coming back in it is. some of the emergency rooms. Really? Yeah. yeah. For pain? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because trust me, you do not, you do not <laughs> feel <laughs> a thing. Uh oh. <laughs> you are awake, but you do not feel any, like you don't feel that even. Yeah, but what oh. else do you feel? <laughs> Not much. I had a procedure where they really stuck a camera down my throat, uh -huh. and yeah. apparently, I mean, I didn't know if they were talking to me and telling me what to do, and I was reacting, but I had no idea what happened. Yeah. Hmm. So I don't so, know what they did. <laughs> so they probably gave you a first set. Yeah. So, so ketamine, one of the things that they've started doing with this ketamine is kind of um, like it hits, a, it, I don't know whether the idea is that maybe it'll hit a reset button. Okay, so people that have had, I think we've talked about um, re reflex sympathetic dystrophy where it's like one leg will go completely bonkers with the fight or flight system, or one arm. Um, so what they'll do is they'll, they'll put you under with ketamine where you like literally cannot feel anything at all. I mean, you, you're awake, maybe not alert, but you're awake for it. And the whole idea is, is if we can get the signals to stop Maybe they won't start again when the ketamine oh, wears oh. off. Really? So they have to try to kind of... It's like a restart. Like yeah, it's like hitting the reset button. Wow. It's like, uh, you know, I'm thinking, uh, you know, computers work better if you just shut them down for a minute or two. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> Very true. But, uh, but so that's one of the treatments. And, I, you know, honestly, I, I heard about them running those... Um, running the, the, the experiments, I have not heard too the, much about... The Special K experiment. <laughs> <laughs> right? That was what they called it on the street. That's I, I know, I know. know. I know. Special K. K. Special K. If you mix it with alcohol, it's really not good at all. Oh, oh, Causes hallucinations, a whole bunch of that. I wouldn't know about that, but I, I just read. Oh, okay. <laughs> just read about it. <laughs> yeah, cousin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my cousin. His name was um, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so so this is called. It's not an opiate. It's under a different label. It's a good cousin. Yeah, it's really not an opiate. Okay. I think it it targets the opiate receptor, but also other receptors as well. Is that true? Is that how that works? Okay. Um, They've used it uh, actually as an animal tranquilizer right. for many years. Yeah, and it, it just basically paralyzes you and it don't feel anything at all. But, I mean, are you able to function or is it? 
Not for a while. You'd be in the hospital while this is happening. Not so much. Oh, wow. Yeah, you'd be flat on your back for a little while. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then the last one. Toxins from a cone snail. <laughs> Original. Yeah, right? Okay, so is it psychonotide? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just guessing on the pronunciation on that. Um, so calcium channel blockers. Calcium is, ends up being really, really, really important in terms of transmitting the signal up the nerve. Okay. Okay, so without those calcium channels, it's not going to go anywhere. Okay. Okay, so if you blocked, if you have something that will block all of those, then you're not going to get very good signals. Problem with that, I can imagine, <laughs> is that you can't just block the signals here <laughs> or here. You're going to block them everywhere. Okay, so you just have to remember that with any medication you take, you're going to you're going to affect not just the system that it's targeted at, but everything else. And the body is an incredible um, recycler. It uses very similar and very almost the, the same receptors and, and chemicals to do a whole bunch of different things. So if you're, you know, increasing the amount of cortisol, it's also going to increase the amount, the other work that the cortisol does in your body. So um, that would be the big take home, I think, for this, is just to understand that the body um, is, is not separate pieces, that it's all, it's all one, it's all connected, and that if you take medication for one thing, it's going to affect everything else. Okay. Right, and uh, there's a whole category of calcium channel blockers that are used for blood pressure. So, you know, while you're using this for inflammation or pain, you're also going to affect the, you can affect the blood pressure. Okay. So. Well, this sounds yeah. like a, it sounds like a good medicine, though. Well, yeah, but you're, you know, kind of like I said, you're, you got a kind of a potent med here that can really work wonders, or seem to, uh, but you also got to look at those negative effects. You know, you can have some serious negative effects, too, if it lowers your blood pressure and heart rate and um, you know, just to get rid of the pain may not be a good idea. Hmm. Yeah, you bend over to tie your shoe and you fall on your head. And, yeah. 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 And all of a sudden, you know, you have neck problems as well as <laughs> <Wow. laughs> <laughs> or concussion or... Okay, so um, opiate addiction. I'm sure we've all heard about it. If anybody here takes opiates, you know that you pretty much have to submit to fairly frequent urine tests. You um, finding it harder and harder to get your medication. You actually have to come in now once a month instead of just calling in for refills. Um, part of that is is because a lot of these drugs are obtained from friends and family. You know, the kids go through grandma's medicine cabinet, sell it on the street, make a tidy profit, oh. you know. Um, and the, the whole thing, the whole thing is, again, um, well, that, that's what screws the rest of us. Yeah. That kind of stuff screws everybody else up. Yeah. 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 And that's what we're dealing with. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's get off of them. If we can. Okay. All right. So um, the other thing is if you take them and you don't have um, the level of pain that they're prescribed for, sometimes you can get the euphoria and the pleasure and the uh, kind of, oh, I feel good. Um, the problem with that is that as you take, that tends to diminish because those opiate receptors, they get filled in. Right. Okay. And now suddenly you body make more opiate receptors, so you need more to get the same effect. Right? Same thing as you do with pain control. Um, but then when you stop trying to take it, you have that withdrawal symptom. So now you're not taking it to feel good. You're, feeling, you're taking it to not feel bad right. anymore. Right. Okay? Um, also, as you increase that dose, you're increasing the likelihood of 
decreasing the respiration. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. And then uh, it suppresses you know, respiration. You get so low on that, and you're just going to quit breathing. Right. And then you go into yeah. cardiac arrest and that. Yeah. And then something else that happens, I know, with a lot of people, and it's, an, it's I, I hear about this mostly with street drugs. Um, I treat a couple of cops. Um, and so they bring me these stories, and basically what seems to happen is is that if you can get off of this addictive medication or addictive drug, and then you fall off the wagon, now your tolerance isn't quite as low as it, or as high as it was, and so you take the same amount or even just half, and it still is enough to OD. So you still have, you know, so a lot of, that's seen a lot. It happens all the time. Uh, that is seen a ton when you when people finally get clean. And then they go back, they fall off the wagon, they go back on it, and they, they OD. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I, it happened to someone I knew just about two months ago. Um, and she oh, was she was doing so good, but she slept, and now she's gone. So mm -hmm. something to think about as well. Right. All right, so did I go over the, the 2000 AMA campaign to aggressively treat chronic pain. Did you want to go through that? Go ahead. You're doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so basically, we um, we have some of these these medications that are considered that, that are considered controlled substances. And so around um, to the year 2000, AMA started to realize that that chronic pain is actually kind of a big deal in this country and that maybe we should try to figure out what's going on and why people are using so many opiates. And, um, <clears throat> so it, this has gotten progressively more stringent as time goes on. The DEA has now decided to change the prescribing pattern. Um, so now you're required to send in lists of everybody yeah, who... Yeah, Illinois pharmacies every 15 days have to send a list of all the control substances with patient name, address, doctor, uh, into the state DEA. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if they see, um, you know, a pattern... A where, name on several pharmacies. Right, yep. Yeah. Uh, okay. Then they're going to go yeah. investigate. Yeah. Um, that's good. I always thought they always did that. I didn't realize that was a new thing. I thought I just figured they always kind of did that for. No, not really. Um, you know, if, if somebody was, if a pharmacy was ordering a tremendously large amount of opiates, one version or another, uh, every week or every right. month, then they, uh, then they say, hmm, you know, you're, you're, what's something's going on here, you know, so uh -huh. because. Um, you know, you're maybe ten times the average of the pharmacies right. in your area, so they don't look for it. Um, uh, interesting thing now, they're uh, not all the states are hooked up, but uh, it's getting so uh, doctors, uh, especially useful probably in the emergency room, uh, can get online right away and look for your name, and if it comes up, see what you're taking, how often you're taking, often you're taking. Um, you know, so what that's good. You so they know to. that you're not like right. registered at five other places. Right. So that's good. Yeah. The thing that's hurting is a lot of old arthritic patients have been on this for ten years and so forth. Uh, you know, they're trying to cut them down too, and so there <laughs> is kind of a, you know. <laughs> a big problem. Like Twenty-year-old people making these laws <laughs> who've never had a pain in their life. They somehow think that as you get older, all of a sudden your joints are going to become happy. And <laughs> that's, that's amazing to me that they actually are doing this. I know they're doing it. It's uh, amazing. Well, uh, the opiates are still the number one prescribed drug, or pres number one for prescriptions in this country. Wow. Really? Yeah. They yep. They, you know, huh. they take the record every year, or at least half the last four or five, um, for most number of prescriptions written. Wow. So, oh. most used and abused drugs yeah. in America. Yep. Oh. And that's kind of, I think, why the DEA, federal DEA, got in there and said, you know, we should have something like 
blood pressure or diabetes treatment or something, number one, you know, pain pills, especially opiates, mm, should really be that, you know. You're underestimating the, uh, the problem with chronic pain that we have in the country, though, too. Mm -hmm. right. So, um, at note about withdrawal on the chronic pain and the drawing off of uh, opiates is that a lot of people now are turning to street drugs and illegal drugs to kind of, um, ease that withdrawal. And of course with street drugs you never ever know what you're actually getting. Um, it was uh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, where they were starting to cut that with fentanyl, cut heroin with fentanyl. And then we're getting a lot of OD sound heroin from that. There were a lot of heroin deaths for like two Chicago weeks. Chicago a few years ago. Yeah. They started doing that. And literally like 15 people died in just a weekend or something. Yeah. I mean, this was ridiculous. There were probably about six or seven deaths in one week here in Peoria. Yeah. And it, I, one of them was the gal that I knew. And so, I mean, it was just, so just be careful. <laughs> no I'm not saying say no to say yeah, no. say no. Just no Nancy Nancy Reagan. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, so the Narcan is a antidote, right? Right. To it, it will pull you right out of that overdose state back into reality in seconds. Okay. Wow. It, they used to use it uh, uh, and still probably do some uh, in surgery. If they use an opiate, put you out, take care of some pain while they're working on you. Um, you know, when they got done, give them a dose of that Narcan, and boom, patient's wide awake and I'm about jump start. And ready, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but you know, again, you have to uh, think when you got a, kind of a chronic patient, whether it's on the street or uh, wherever, um, and you use that if they're they think of an overdose and you can't wake them up give them that it's going to pop them right back in a few seconds but then you're going to go into a withdrawal because narcan has knocked all those opiates off the receptors and they're hurting wow and feeling if they've been taking this stuff for 10 years or two years um, you know they're back into a withdrawal because body says, hey, I need more drug, and there's none to be had, yeah, or can't get to the receptor. Well, that sounds like a fun ride. Yeah, right. <laughs> Let's try to avoid that if we can. <laughs> <that one. laughs> All right. Marijuana. I think we have about 10 minutes. I got to keep Oh, do you? I got kids to. Okay. I don't right. want to pick them up, but the state says you have to. The state says you have to. Huh? to Alright, so here's some written information on that. Alright, thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Pharmacist Dave, you. thank you. Yeah. I'll see you guys. Let me bring my binge yeah. unit next month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll sit here and use it while we're sitting here, yes. Alrighty. Definitely. Here. I'll All try right. to remember it. Last minute you edition. Thank you, you too. Last minute edition on that. Um, so, marijuana. Why do we think it's the wonder drug? Because it is. See, this is what I. This is anytime, anytime it fixes. <laughs> anytime you can say one drug fixes everything, and it's not water, I have to really question. <laughs> exactly how it works. Um, we all have cannabinoid receptors in our bodies that are pretty much everywhere. Um, uh, basically, my understanding is that it, it helps, it's kind of like an opiate receptor, a receptor in an acts similar way, just a different receptor. Hmm. Okay. Um, I do know that it has um, it has uh, effects in all kinds of different parts of the body, like in um, and I can't find where my highlighted stuff is, but um, here it is. Um, that it can help regulate appetite and blood pressure, um, bone growth, tumor modulation, immunity, inflammation, nociception, the danger signals, uh, memory, and muscle tone. Um, so that's an awful lot. 
Those are those cannabinoid receptors must be everywhere. <laughs> All right. So, so what about what about uh, central nervous system depressant, which means that it just makes it less likely for nerves to fire, right? So it's going to slow down your reaction. Probably a little bit of thought process. Um, yeah, Except they, when things are funny. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's why they you know, <laughs> <laughs> I did snort. Just kind of mellows you out. Just, you know, well, you know, think of that. Slow though. things. Now. Right. Think of that as you're driving too, because right. you know, it's like, oh yeah, I have to stop. Well, maybe I'll hit them first. You know, oh. um, but uh, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. There's <laughs> people in my neighborhood that do it. If I get a whiff of it, it chokes me. Yeah. It makes my throat feel like it's close enough. Yeah, don't care mm -hmm. for it then. Not at all. Well, there's certainly a lot of people that uh, that have chronic pain that swear by it. Swear by it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, they do beat yeah. stings too, but you know, there's just yeah, certain the, things the that I'm not venom, up for. Yeah, the venom. Venom. <laughs> bee venom. I, I know people that use bee venom and swear by it too. Um, and and I think that the part of this is is to understand that. Every body is different, right? And so, you know, is one one kind of medication may not work for you. Another another might. And I think it's important to know, you know, to be able to report to your doctor that one didn't work. Okay. So if it's an opiate receptor and it didn't work for you, that to me indicates that maybe there's some inflammation in the nerves, because if the opiate receptor is increasing that. Right. May you know, kind of make it worse, and so no, it didn't work for me. So that's kind of, to me, that's important information for your doctor to have. Sure. I wanted sense. to ask you guys that we discuss a lot about the pharmaceuticals, but what about vitamins and, and natural things like that? Right. And that may be a whole different topic, and, and that's fine. But there's a lot of good vitamins and stuff out there that. I do really good with maca. I buy the powder, mm -hmm. mix it in hot water, and it's awful. I mean, it's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it, terrible. But I can. I mean, to me, it doesn't bother me anymore. You know, you just get immune to it. But uh -huh. you know, that that does me gives me energy. Just uh -huh. makes me feel good. Yeah. Well, a lot of people do B12 shots. B12 shots are really important for getting the energy and the oxygen into the nerves and and into the other body cells. So you can see where that may help reduce pain if now your your nerve cells are getting the oxygen and the and the food that it needs. Sure. You can see where that might decrease pain. Um, so I mean there's there's a lot out there in terms of that. Um, I can give you some there's there's the book The Why Why Isn't My Brain Working has a lot of I love that title. <laughs> um, it's about depression and, and anxiety most for the most part, but I think that, that chronic pain, depression, weight gain, all of these things I think of more as, they're more symptoms of a body that's not quite working properly. And if you can address the underlying symptom, which is, for example, you know, high, high immune response, you know, a global immune response to an autoimmune issue, issue or, um, you know, high allergies, something that you're getting into that you don't realize that your body's reacting to, you can take that down. That can sometimes help to relieve some of the pain as well. Mm -hmm. So things like turmeric and ginger and some of those spices can really help to decrease mm -hmm. the overall inflammation in the body. Um, artichokes, if you're exhausted all the time, artichokes can help. Um, convert T4, which is a thyroid hormone, into the usable T3. Um, so if you're feeling fatigued, you know, eat more artichokes. That might help if you have a thyroid issue. I mean, there's lots of things. There's the food as medicine and spices and herbs as medicine is, is there's a long history of a lot of success with that. Um, and so <laughs> gravity well is spreading. <laughs> Um, so there's there's a lot to be said for that, and I mean, you can do that as another <coughs> another class if you want to. Yeah, a little court. Okay. 
anybody else? Oh, yeah, I think that would be good. Okay. I, I do much better on vitamins than I do any pharmaceutical I've ever taken. And I've tried things, you know, but it's like an hour later, it's like, ah, you know, yes. it's like, okay, I'm done, no more. Something, so something I, I just threw away right. 50 bucks, you know, so. Okay. <laughs> the other option <laughs> was um, to go over uh, over sex and pain um, in January so that you're all ready and, and ready to go for Valentine's Day. Oh. All right, and I got a lot so. of stories about that. That's what got me here in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I you know I can leave it up to you guys as far as you know which one you prefer. You know, certainly there's tons of topics, and anytime I get a topic suggestion, I'm more than happy to go th go for it. But um, if anybody wants me to sit here and turn red and talk about sex, that's fine. I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> We can all relate to that. We can all relate. I know we can. Um, or we can go over some of the more natural remedies for pain. And we we'll save that one for March. Save that one for March. For February. February. We'll do sex in January. All right. Yeah. To prepare us for February. Right. Well, you know, Valentine's Day is coming up. I figure right. you might have a New Year's resolution. <laughs> <laughs> she said, "Can you <laughs> Well, we could talk about dating the self, you know. <laughs> anyway. All right. Anyway. That's going to be a rough one. Yeah, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. With this group, it'll be fun. Are they doing any research on the different um, varieties of the marijuana plants? Uh, my understanding is that, yes, they have, and that they ha are starting to pinpoint some of the ones that are better for this type of issue. There's one called Charlotte's Web, which apparently is really, really good for seizures. And then there's another one that's good for anxiety, and I don't know. Um, there, um, there is a thing on Saturday, I think, that from like one to three, where the lady is talking a lot. They're, the lady. The marijuana guru in Peoria. I don't know who she is. Anyway, she is holding a, t a talk and she's talking about the different kinds of marijuana that may be available and appropriate for different types of issues. I think there's a lot of genetic, yeah, genetic engineering going on too to you know, right. develop right. You know, more Certain the strains. Yeah, to get yeah. one that does more for seizure, one mm -hmm. that does more for pain. That's a good thing, though. Good thing. Not wrong. Not bad. So I think that the market <laughs> will, you know, grow definitely in that. Oh yeah. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. Look at Colorado. It grew quick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Kind of the problem, the pharmacy wise, with the marijuana oh, is, uh, oh, as it stands now, you'll right. never see it in a pharmacy. <laughs> which which does make sense to me. Well, yeah, it has to be at a uh, what do they call it? A, uh, uh, dispensary. dispensary. Right. Because now the state classifies it different than the federal Fence, government. Right. Federal government says it's illegal. there's no good uses for it. Right. It's an addictive drug. Uh -huh. uh, we need to stop the use. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's a Schedule 1 there. Mm -hmm. And pharmacy wise, on any control drug, you have to go with whichever is more stringent. So if the state has type of regulations or the federal government does, so we have to follow the federal government because it's still a Schedule One, which you know, is only abuse potential and you no know, good use. Um, so the feds will have to change that before you'll see it in pharmacy. Okay. They, you know, I, I'm they just a little confused with the whole thing. Right that, there. You know, the state can make it legal. But federally, it's illegal. So, you know, it's a little confusing. Right. So but in that I'm sense, sure. the, the states are a little bit ahead of the federal government. Right, right. All right, everybody. Okay.